So today we are joined by Robert Gill. He's a local actor and voice actor. Robert, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Pretty good. So you just got back from Jay where you were building your last set, correct? <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, that is correct. Now, what's the set for? What uh, what film is it for? The set is for our fantasy film Spriggan. Um, it, it's basically the uh, one of the, I want. It's actually earlier in the plot, um, but one of the final scenes that we're shooting. It's a very intense scene. Um, it introduces the knight Cavasil and uh, kind of the order he belongs to. And um, unlike a lot of the scenery in Spriggan, which takes place. Um, in the wilderness and in the forest, um, this is sort of a mountainy uh, region. Very stone, stone floors, uh, stone cut uh, walls and textures, which I'll send you photos of. Nice. And you can't exactly find those in Florida. No, no. That is <laughs> that is a very difficult thing about Florida is that a lot of it is just mainly trees and beach, not much else. So how did you film a fantasy film with just trees and beach? Uh, um, well, as much as I am making fun of Florida about the, um, you know, about the terrain and everything, a lot of it was just finding the right spot. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, and the, my two other compatriots, uh, Chris and Angus, who are heavily involved in this project. Um, Angus, just as an aside, Angus um, and I collaborate a lot on the shots, and he will often come up with ideas on the ways to uh, best get the uh, footage that I need. Uh, he's very, very good cinematographer. Um, Chris is very good with sets and building, and combining that, all three of us kind of had the sensibilities of what kind of fantasy film we wanted. Um, and a lot of that stemming from Dark Souls and like Samurai Jack and kind of like weirder aspects like that. Um, finding like very unique terrain was the first challenge. And I think we, there would be days where we would hike about like 10 miles just out in the wilderness and we would leave kind of, you know, just marks on the trees or just, you know, uh, record it as much as we could with um, the camera. And we ended up just finding, like, very unique, like, very alien-looking places. Just, you know, symmetrical, like, trees planted or um, just really weird regions like that. And um, for a lot of the shots, you know, varying up the wilderness was a real challenge. And playing with natural light as well. There, um, I think there's only two scenes in the entire film where we will have artificial light. Hmm. Yeah, which, you know, you have a lot of natural light down here. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, it is the sunshine state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what kind of story is Spriggan about? Well, Spriggan is, um, how do I say it? It's about, it. the core group is three adventurers who basically have to venture off in the woods to stop an evil. I mean, it's, it's pretty basic, but the key thing I think with Spriggan is that it's more about the atmosphere in the universe itself. There is no central character. Um, I've written quite a bit. Spriggan just being like one slice of this universe um, and one look into just what these people go through. Um, you know, you have Ivor Call, the ranger. You have Drogas, the uh, barbarian, and Cavusil, the knight. And each of these people have their own motivations to go off in the woods and kill whatever it is that is, uh, you know, stalking the surrounding uh, kingdom and uh, just causing mayhem. And along the way, you run into a bard and a thief and all sorts of other people who, you know, have different vested interests in, you know, finding where they go or, you know, stopping the evil, rather. So... <laughs> so. I feel like, I feel you, like George you? Lucas, when he gives those like bullshit interviews, he's like, well, Star Wars is about the religion, um, you know, it's good and evil, and, you know. I went to India once. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, uh, are, are, are you looking to collaborate with anybody on a potential sequel? <laughs> 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 um, you know, 
I was approached about that, but no. <laughs> um, the answer is a strict no. Um, we did this without using Kickstarter. Um, every last dime of this project came from our own pockets. I mean, we went out, we bought the camera, we bought the microphone, we bought the tripod, we replaced the tripod when it broke. Um, you know, none of it was crowdfunded or, you know, used other people's money to do that because we wanted to make a film that for fantasy viewers or fantasy fans rather, I don't think it's touched on enough. I think films kind of like 13th warrior skirts around that where it's like darker fantasy, but you know, not trying to be like Todd McFarlane with like blades coming out the arms and shit. Um, just something that you can watch and enjoy and really get into the atmosphere of. Um, and I, it's very, very difficult to find people who understand that, who, who understand that aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, there hasn't been a lot of good fantasy in the last several years. I'd say that the last good fantasy movie, in my opinion, were the Lord of the Rings films. After that, it just seemed like... Oh, I- Absolutely, and I think uh, Fellowship especially um, was a huge, huge influence on uh, on my take for Spriggan. Um, just in, especially in terms of, um, <clears throat> and I'm not a huge Lord of the Rings uh, nerd, unfortunately. Star Wars was my was my area, uh, but I really like the uh, the scene where they're going up up on the boat, and there's like the two giant ass statues, and they have the hands like this. But just like that scene in general, like kept capturing the scope and knowing that uh, Aragorn, uh, Viggo Mortensen's character, he talks about how he he always wanted to see that, or he always wanted to see those statues. He's never you're you're going there for the first time when he is, and for a lot of these characters, it's the same way. And I really like that aspect of that Lord of the Rings captures well. There's always something else happening in that world when you're not looking. Yeah, and Lord of the Rings just has this incredible lore to it as well that's, you know, if you read read the books, I read the books as a teenager and, you know, there's the Silmarillion and The Hobbit and a bunch of other works and lore and it just makes it very fascinating. I think that's the key thing to fantasy as well, it isn't just the story but also the world building. Yeah, and a lot of um a lot of the world building for Spriggan in like the Spriggan like universe, I guess. Um I don't we 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 haven't really come up with like a name, I guess, for like the larger universe. I mean, but a lot of it just comes from things that you see and things you hear them talk about and not necessarily strictly in the plot. Um Dark Souls is a video game series that's been very very popular. And that's actually based on a book series called Wheel of Time. And the Wheel of Time series is like 14 books long, like really, really detailed. But those two series in general, they never straight up tell you what the plot is. They tell you, or I guess what the, the lore is. They, they don't stop and say, well, this person was here a million years ago. You, A lot of it comes from the characters interacting So you never, in Dark Souls especially, all the games are connected, Bloodborne is connected, but you can never have a reliable source because they're they're getting it from secondhand sources. Their conflict has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years, and likewise in Spriggan, this is not the first time people have rallied together to go get rid of a monster or a creature, nor will it be the last. And this isn't the first time the ranger has had to go stop something or the knight has had to go out and go do something. So, for a lot of these characters, they're already coming from an established past. You know, none of them are trying to necessarily prove themselves. And I think that's a big deal in terms of lore. So, going back to how you shot the film using your own money and the money of the people who are working on the film, does that make you feel a bit more liberated in your creative choices? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think working on... Uh, larger projects while it's nice to have like the stability in there and knowing that okay if I go and work on this Hulu series we all we're all together in this big room well it has to work right I'm getting paid X amount of money to be there but there's so much that you're limited on what you can do because ultimately it's up to one guy and 
one, you know, the company's vision because they financed it. Um, a, a big thing with this was that, you know, we could have you know, real tobacco on set. I mean, we, we could we could really have the characters say what they want or how you know really express themselves. Um, the production company for this is called Red Cloud Consort, and it's called a consort because it's while I am directing the film and I was primarily writing it, it came there a lot of it also came from you know two other people who also understand where I'm coming from it and a lot of the and this goes for the actors as well um Nick Leally uh Jacqueline Bernstein um you know Scott you know all of them Salim as well all of them and in fact on that note Salim actually knew about this you know or kind of knew I wanted to do this uh, uh, I want to say three or four years ago when we were doing theater. So uh, shout out to him. But uh, yeah, shout out to Salim. You know, we go all the yeah, way back. Yeah, shout to out to Salim. <laughs> Salim Creechy. We but, go uh, all the way back to. Uh... <laughs> he somehow he somehow gets in every fucking project, <laughs> like one way or another. It's just like, man, I really need somebody to play Salim. <laughs> Salim can play. He plays a thief in our movie. <laughs> and does a great job, dude. So I have but, a, I have a story about Salim. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is pretty good. So he went to Pensacola High with me, I think for our first three years, maybe. I think he left after junior year. Maybe he left after sophomore year, but he was there for a good while. And uh, um, so he, he he wasn't helping his case, wearing camouflage to school like every day. <laughs> every day. Well, not every day, but maybe two or three times a week. So we would, you know, we would make jokes and everything. Uh about how he looked like, you know, he was an Al Qaeda fighter wearing all this, all this camo, all camo too. It wasn't just like a camo shirt; it'd be like camo pants and everything. And uh, um, so we were. It was in French, French class, and we were taking a, a test. And so Salim's watch starts beeping, and so my friend Jason runs out of the classroom screaming, "Everyone, get out!" <laughs> <laughs> the uh we were on set for a uh, spriggan and this was like a 14 hour shoot day um we had gone out and no this was this was the second day so this is still this is about a 10 hour shoot day rather i'll get to the first day later but uh i guess Celine was having to fast now we're we are 10 miles out in the woods in july I mean, this is sweltering heat. We're all in costumes. I mean, I probably should have been sued at some point for it, but I don't want to give anybody ideas. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, it was just miserable. It was hot. We had the river right there, though, to cool us off. We had, a, you know, water and everything. But Salim Strep was not eating. And then he told me he couldn't drink water. And I, I was like, Salim, it's like 98 degrees outside. And you're wearing, like, robes. and everything. You, you, have to, you have to drink something. And just like his dedication to that was just, you know, to what he believes in and really, uh, really astounded me. And in, in, in a good way, I don't mean that in a bad way at all, in a very good way. And uh, he's very, he's very committed when he uh, gets on a project. Yeah. Well, that's what you need to, you know, that's what you really need for people, especially in these indie productions. I mean, we're talking about how it's definitely a bit more collaborative than some of the bigger productions and i actually think that's better you're with yeah. a group of friends you know what i mean and you're all sort of bouncing ideas off and ultimately one person you know says yeah let's go with this one but it's very nice to be in a more creative atmosphere that you may not get with huge budget productions where it's like no this is what you have to do yeah i i don't i honestly don't think that after this i I would work on a large uh, production again. Um, I just haven't been. I've done it several, several times now. Um, I've done one day. I've done a few weeks. Um, and I just I, I worked on one project and it was hell below where it was full speaking lines. It was very, very involved. But like the amount of time you put into that, you have to think you're like, well, I'm fulfilling this guy's vision with zero input. Mm hmm. And on a lot, especially filming down here in the South and in Florida, you have to remain grateful. You know, you, you have to be very gracious to be on these sets. And, 
if you think about it, the amount of strain and stress and time you put in to work on these sets, I mean, you could you could just as easily try to come up with something original and well and put it out there and uh, and honestly probably reach a larger audience. Yeah, especially with a lot of like the horror movies and the Jean-Claude Van Damme and Steven Seagal movies that shoot down here. You yeah, know? especially. And I mean, you always, you always have NCIS. That's a, Oh, yeah. <laughs> NCIS New Orleans. It's always a steady uh, <laughs> steady employer. <laughs> yeah. And they are and they pay like the most out of like any of the productions on the Gulf which Coast. Which isn't much. Yeah, which isn't much either. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about how much people get paid on productions. That yeah, the, there really is. I mean, you have to, it, it, especially when they'll call, they, they cattle call a lot of actors, and we've gotten away from. You think with a larger budget, you could get more quality people on a set, and it's not the case. No, it's not. It's, I have a large budget for the set. People are always so worried about the actual set and. You know, I, I think for Spriggan we spent maybe five grand, and it'll be near—I want to say near feature length, if not feature length, near feature length. And I know people who around here film with five grand, ten grand, and they can only do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they can only do. You know, they, they're so worried about having like a red camera. You know, eight K. All this, I mean, Spriggan's going to be 1080. You know, the next project will be 4K. I've invested in that already. But, you know, tell a good story. Worry about the acting and the writing. And you can make the sets work. You know, work with what you have and what you're given. Yeah. Instead of trying big budget sets and small, you know, smaller groups who can get the money and may as well be a large set, you know, in practice – they they all bungle that, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, there is a sense of, you know, putting the cart before the horse with a lot of productions, not really understanding what makes a good film and what what doesn't. And uh, there's not a huge writing community down here either. And I noticed that a lot of people who uh, who write screenplays for their shorts, they don't really... I don't know of a com- maybe it's out there, but I don't know of a community of people that legitimately try to critique others' writing before they actually make the films. Because I see a lot yeah. of short films, and a lot of them just are, you know, like there's good potential in these short films, but it's really just not reached. Yeah, Spriggan was was definitely one of those where. I, you know, just like most people say, I've always been writing. I've always been a writer. Um, Spriggan, I wrote in, I think, maybe three days, maybe a week. I don't know, somewhere around there. And it's like maybe seven pages, but I didn't write in a ton of detail. It's not a hundred page script or anything. Um, But the ending was very different from, uh, I wouldn't say very different. Close to the ending, the main like conflict was very different than what was originally written, and that was mainly because when writing it, we were like, "Can we actually do that?" No. Yeah. Does that actually need to be in there? Like originally, so it, this is a spoiler. If you care about those things, I don't. I don't really care about spoilers. I don't think it takes away from it. But you know, originally the spring, like the spring, like comes out of the uh, the pit. Well, originally, it gets knocked in and when it comes out it's like this eldritch you know deer monstrosity coming out and i mean we i had it like planned out but that alone was going to be like 500 to a grand and it that's sure that's not a lot of money but what what is that adding that's the main thing is like to go through all that and to have this thing if it can't look perfect it's not worth doing that's my thing like yeah why throw that money to that when you can throw it to extra days for filming? Because, I mean, you have to... That's the biggest thing with, with the indie filming and with, like, the writing is, like, when you're writing it out, it's, like, how much of this can you actually fulfill and how much of it does it actually need to be in there? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And, 
you know, when you're writing something with the intention of shooting it and you're at our level where you're pretty much going to be paying for it out of your pocket, you, you really have to think about what is absolutely necessary. And just writing, too, around things that you know that you can get for free or cheap. And there's really no shame in that either. You know, some people think that they, you know, some people think that you shouldn't, um, that you shouldn't limit yourself budgetarily when you write screenplays. But man, if you want to shoot it, like you better, <laughs> or else you're going to write yeah, Star Wars yeah. and then only have like a, you know, a shitty camcorder and a teenage kid to act in it. Yeah, and I mean, people say that all the time. They're like, well, just grab a camera and go. Just grab a camera and go. And I think maybe that's not the right approach because it's like if you have if you just tell someone well just grab a camera and go you're telling them that don't worry about the quality you just make something well don't worry about the quality you just make something and with today's day and age when like you said or like when you're on our level and you're paying for it yourself well at this point in the game you have to ask yourself that where, where the lines have blurred in terms of like the level i mean like they they recently came out with this netflix series called altered carbon that takes a ton of shit from blade runner and it looks like it would be on the sci-fi channel at like 10 10 o'clock at night like some stargate atlanta shit but i mean there's a happy medium in there like you can still if you know you're gonna make stargate or if you know you're gonna make this generic sci-fi it's liberating like Spriggan is somewhat generic fantasy and the liberty comes from it just had it shot well and it looks cool and in that essence at that point you just don't have to know how to to word it a lot of people write it like there's a recent fantasy film i watched where it's shot in like ak you know it, it looks it looks good i guess but you know, you can tell where the budget went. You can tell what the focus was. If you had, if you had taken that money, paid the actors, or like if you had paid up specific people, that didn't really pay a lot. A lot of the actors, or let me rephrase this: none of the actors got paid for Spriggan. I had to pay like makeup artists, poster artists, I had to pay crew people. But unfortunately, you know, I wasn't able to pay the actors. So a lot of that was. I can't bitch and moan about it, but I can work with them. And fortunately, a lot of them understood what we were trying to do. And I, I feel like when you're on like our level, and, and you know this because you've, you know, you've produ you produce Wake and mm -hmm. direct Wake. I'm sorry, and, um, and a couple other you know, shorts. Other, yeah, yeah. And a couple other shorts that there's ideally like the level. If you could just stretch out the time, you can make a feature. And then, yeah. and nowadays you have the ability to get it on Amazon. You have the ability to get it on Netflix. So the barrier has effectively dropped. And the problem is that we're telling people just have a camera and shoot. It's okay. When we, you and I are going to be the ones to set the bar or, you know, people in our, in our sphere or, you know, on this level are the ones who are setting the bar for the, for the people who follow us. Yeah. And, you know, you don't have to have a Hollywood production to make a good movie that there's pl you know there are plenty of great movies that have very small productions there's a new movie coming out called golden exits and it was shot for very little money supposedly the actors for the feature film got paid somewhere between two grand and four grand and the actors are like chloe savigny and jason schwartzman and some other uh, some other big act emily browning um, yeah. some big name actors and they got paid very little just because they want to do the project and they shot it on super 16 up in Manhattan and with a crew of, I think that the director, Alex Ross Perry said that the crew at max was 15 people at maximum crew was 15. And it was a lot of times it was smaller than that, but it's getting a theatrical release and it's getting, you know, and it's getting video on demand probably pretty soon. And, you know, and Alex Ross Perry has made a career out of making these kinds of movies. And it's not Hollywood, but a lot of times it's a bit more, you know, the, the writing and the directing style is a lot more honest, I think. He's tackling stuff that Hollywood wouldn't, wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. Like, completely unlikable characters is one thing. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think that's what people want to see. And, like, people... There's nothing wrong with doing a sci-fi, but, like, Star Wars at this point, when the way it's churned out, it's not, it's not quality. And people want... You know, it doesn't have to be Barry Lyndon. I mean, it doesn't have to be something that is, you know, extremely, you know, high art. But at the same time, you like, do you need 200 crew people on set? No, I don't think there's a there's a rational instance where you need that many crew. Like I, I I've seen it where there's like eight PAs just standing around, mm-hmm. or, or there's like extra camera dudes standing around. It's just like. Who's operating the camera? Okay, everybody else get the fuck out of here. Because you're just extra people who are taking away from the magic. Like, 15 people to me, like, I mean, we had a crew of, like, maybe four at a time. I think, you know, and a lot of times we were hopping back and forth from in front of the camera, behind the camera, in front, behind. And, I mean, it's just one of those things where you save money and you're also maintaining the magic you're maintaining a sense of place is there are there ever 200 people in real life collaborating other than on a movie or in the military or something like that i mean it's it's very i think hollywood has gotten very very artificial where they're at yeah i think it's just bloated you know and it just seems too that they're putting they're moving away from these like 40 50 million dollar pictures and putting a lot of money into these 150 200 250 uh million dollar pictures i mean justice league was 300 million dollars yeah like and for what for and it doesn't look better than like a cw like series or something like that and it's like and even that 40 million like think about think about what you could make for 40 million dollars like this is five thousand for you know spriggan if i had 10 grand that would change. That would change so much. Having ten grand, fifty grand, a hundred grand. How much do you need to pay these people in order to do that? I understand you have to pay like actors. Like there's actors you're gonna want. I want a million dollars. I want five hundred thousand dollars. Well, obviously, if you're working on a project that requires that, sure. But think about all the actors who are actually decent, good actors, who would take. I'll take fifty grand to be in Dune. Like if someone came up to me and they're like. Will you do? Will you shoot a year for fifty grand on Dune? Uh, sure, knowing that it's gonna be eighteen hour days. Yes, because Dune Dune would be like a good project. Whereas Star Wars for fifty grand, fuck that. I know that they're gonna shoot on five hundred million bazillion dollars. I'm gonna take ten million dollars and I want silk toilet paper, minimum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, Mel Gibson made Hacksaw Ridge for forty million dollars. And, yeah, and they, what, on Hacksaw Ridge, there's this big battle scene. I haven't seen it yet. I need to, though. It's really um, good. But yeah, there's this battle scene where I guess there's a lot of explosions, of course, and they would not give him more cameras. He's like, I need multi-camera setup. They're like, no, you get the one camera. And he's like, what the fuck am I going to do? He goes and buys, and I have it right there, he buys a Panasonic G7, and then he buys some um, black little black magic cameras. He just puts them under rocks. He went to an, just a tech store and bought these with his own money. Just turned them on and put them under rocks. And that's where a lot of the scenes came from. And I mean, when Mel Gibson has to do that, you know, is it really, is it really now, are we really on a lower level if we're doing the same thing, if we're shooting the same way? There's no excuse, I don't think, for you know, indie films do not have the same quality, especially with the tech that we have. Yeah, and I mean, Mel Gibson is no stranger to paying for his own productions, which is why he's he's worth so much money now because he self-funded Passion of the Christ, I think, right? The $25 yeah, million. Dollars. Yeah. That was $25 million. I, he made, I believe so. He made something like $600 million profit off of that movie. Yeah, and he's doing, uh, I think, The Resurrection now. Yeah, The Resurrection. He says it's yeah. going to be the biggest movie in cinematic history. <laughs> <laughs> well, it probably will be because yeah. Get That Gringo was my movie of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I love Mel Gibson. and I yeah, love, see, I'm a huge fan. Yeah, I love Vince Vaughn too. Uh, Brawl and Cell Block 99 was awesome. <laughs> if any, I, you know, I I don't know. I don't know what it was about Cell Block 99, Vince Vaughn. What was it, you know? He, just something about about him 
and there's a scene where he's fighting this particular officer in the hallway. I don't know, <laughs> but I just like the outcome. <laughs> Dude, the movie, <laughs> the movie is just like, it's just filled to the brim with <laughs> kind of cheese ball humor in a way, but also like just super gory, bloody violence. <laughs> which are two things that just go so great together. And Vince It is, I mean Yeah. And Vince Vaughn's this huge guy, and it's like the only movie I've seen him in where they make him look like the huge guy that he is. Yeah, because I, I I was like, damn dude, this guy is fucking jacked. And then I, yeah. I my girlfriend was watching Dodgeball and I was like, Oh yeah, I can kind of see that now. And it's weird how just like positioning changes everything. Yeah, and you know, uh Vince Ben Spawn, I mean, in uh, Cell Block 99, he's the kind of the guy that you could see a meme coming out of, like, <laughs> you walk into GameStop and this guy <laughs> slaps your girlfriend's yeah, ass, just what like... do you do? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know that old meme. Yeah, like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just comes in and, I mean, I, I just think that, you know, a lot of people ragged on that movie because he's a bald-headed white guy, but I mean, there's, you know... It, that's another thing with Hollywood that I think indie films are always going to be able to trump is that you can kind of, for every five indie dudes who are virtue signaling and stuff like that, there's going to be the one who's just, get get the fuck in here if you think you can play this character. White, black, dog, cat. I mean, it's just, you know, it, you're worried, you're more worried about that. And I think that's going to, you're going to see that big shift in the next few years. Yeah, and I think that virt- just virtue signaling as a whole in movies is turning out not to be profitable. I I usually get turned off from a movie if it's overtly political. Yeah, either either way, yeah. if it doesn't if it doesn't fit in with a plot or if it, you know, if they're going like and you're a traitor, we're we're all rebels. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the evil empire. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. that, but you know what movie was even worse as far as that was The Post. The Post um, were the last, I'm going to do a video on ranking my Oscar movies, you know, the best picture movies, ranking them from worst to best. Like from this past year? Yeah, or? from this past year. The ones that are nominated for best picture. Uh, number two is going to be Dunkirk. Um, yeah. That was sure. good. But number eight. My least favorite, it's a little spoiler to people, was The Post. I absolutely hated that movie. It was so terrible. And in the last 30 minutes, it's basically a bunch of monologues about like, uh, oh, there's one monologue by Meryl Streep's character where she's like, Ooh, Meryl she, Streep. she's like, this isn't my husband's company anymore. This is my company, which I would have, <laughs> okay, so I would have bought, right? Like, the, oh, that this is her company yeah. had... Like you seen her actually running the company up until that. Yeah, point. why not? But you don't. Yeah, why you, not? You do don't. It? You don't really see her running the company. All, all like you see her doing is either lounging around her house or going out to fancy dinners with people. And then, so then she has this thing where, and then Tom Hanks is the guy doing all the work in the movie. Of course. And uh, but then they shoehorn in these like these monologues. He's like. And it was obvious, like, just virtue signaling monologues. And the movie up until that point was, it was all right. And it just, that whole third act really turned me off from the whole film. And then the ending where it's like, and then Watergate happens. And then I, and then in my mind I go, oh, so you're just making me think of the movie All the President's Men, which is a thousand times better than this film. Yeah. And then, but they're making, probably cost less. And it, yeah, probably cost less. Yeah. The Post was a $50 million movie and most of the film is in two or three locations. Wow. Yeah. It's that like that's insane. There are a lot of indies that I think are doing very interesting things in Hollywood right now, but I think the one of the problems that we have in the indie market is the oversaturation. There's yeah. so many people making all sorts of things. Everyone's a filmmaker now. And it makes it hard to stand apart from everybody else. 
I think I think too that that can be a blessing though because if you're chasing a lot of these a lot of these filmmakers <laughs> it's like toss my cat in the halfway across the room um, a lot of these filmmakers though are chasing like Oscars or are chasing that I mean Bright isn't gonna win an Oscar I think it's called Bright isn't it the one with Will Smith yeah. and the Brooklyn weird orc cop yeah. I don't know but. <laughs> That has like a low critical rating. Audience loves it, ninety eight percent. They love it, right? Mm Because they like Will Smith. And Netflix eats that up. The Last Jedi, critics love it, and majority, it's at like forty seven percent. Regardless, regardless of how you feel, if you know forty only forty seven percent approve of it. So, and obviously that's always taken with a grain of salt. Because it both made a lot of money, but the point is that, you know, you're going to have these indies who, are, who, the minute they get a taste of, like, big production, bam, they're done being indie. Like, Tarantino is not indie. No, he's not. Nor I, he, he's, I barely would ever qualify him as indie, except for maybe his first, like, one or two flicks, but... You know, he. I don't think he really gets to say that. Neither does maybe, maybe Kevin Smith. Like, maybe, but... Um, and you know, opinion about them inside. That's they get to have the air about them that's indie. Whereas, I I don't really think that's true. Independent is based on what kind of films are you making, you know. And nowadays, especially with so many people making the films in Netflix, like you can go to Netflix or Amazon, just be like, here's my movie, here's my movie. Does it look decent? Okay, we'll take it. And now it's just going to be putting it in front of people and saying, well, my writing is better. Well. We didn't have as much shit, but look at it anyway. And I think people are going to respect lower budget indie films because that's what people want sometimes. Yeah, well, how I feel, and no, it's not really how I feel, but what I've noticed, I should say, is people our age and younger are more like gravitating towards YouTube and these sorts of like content creation type of videos, the videos that are made for almost no money at all. Right. You know, and they're not going to the cinemas as much as the older audiences are. That there is a definite shift in what they like to watch. I mean, they like to, people younger than us, Generation Z, I think I'm the last millennial uh, so, so to speak, because I think millennials <laughs> end at like 1994, which is the year I was born. So starting 1995, it was Gen Z. So I guess everyone younger than me is Gen Z, but it seems like, yeah. So kids generation Z, I don't think they're as interested in seeing spectacle on the big screen because they can get spectacle in their own video games where they control the spectacle. You can blow up a whole house or whatever in battlefield yeah you know or something like that they're a lot more engaging too i mean you know i'm a you know i'm a i'm a gamer uh i'm a a hardcore video gamer i mean (laughs) at this point um i mean there's video games that tell better stories than the movies that are coming out dark souls and bloodborne being one of them and part of it is that i mean you can't really compare the two mediums because one is based on uh an experience, you know, something that only you can do. There's games like Bloodborne or Dark Souls where people can't beat it. There's there's places where just people give up. The game is, you know, is extremely hard, but the more you progress, you know, you get to see the beauty, of, you know, of the environments and everything. But, um, and a lot of them are Japanese made, but it's interesting because people won't, won't watch a foreign film. People will mm-hmm. watch anime, but they won't watch a foreign film. Or, you know, something like that. The standards for film have dropped. You know, film is, is seen as something that you just, you pay a shit ton of money to or you go to the theater with. And I think, like you said, that the spectacle is worn off. You now you expect it. Like, Gladiator still, like, wows me. Or Lord of the Rings still wows me. And, like, it's scope. Or, like, because it's, it's just some dudes in costumes on the in nature. They didn't, it's not like they built that fucking set. But... Mm-hmm. Now it's now everybody wants Guardians of the Galaxy or they want Avengers and 
it, it wears off. It's like if you constantly take a drug, you're going to get immune to it after a while. And now you need the next thing, the next thing. And video games perpetually offer that because inherently the experience can't always be the same. So Yeah, and especially with, you know, role-playing games uh, where you create your own character. And I think that that kind of interactive storytelling that you get from games like Dark Souls or The Witcher, where you definitely create your own persona that you project into the game and then it feels like you're actually a part of this world which is very difficult to do in film right as much as as much as i love film like i don't think i'll ever make a video game but i know that i'll make movies yeah but it is it's it's different and you have to you know i think that the old people in hollywood right now don't understand that this is really where kids are right now. This is what they like. So when you make a movie, try to maybe do something that's not something they can get out of out of a video game. Yeah, I mean, it's like Avengers or uh, anything like that. It's like, well, I can go and play the Arkham games or I can go and play, you know, any, any game like that. And Yeah, Titanfall or and, something to... Yeah, yeah. Like Call of Duty, it's just like a lot of pe- people would rather play Call of Duty than go see like a war film. Like there's a ton of Call of Duty players, if you think about it, that haven't seen Platoon. But mm-hmm. they play Call of Duty. I mean, and it's lost on them because it's about it's not about the act of somebody dying. It's how many, you know, can I kill or you know, it's about it's about playing and enjoying like the gameplay. It's not about it's not always about like the story and everything like that. It's something like video games accomplish something film can't and that's not a slight on film it's just that it's a different medium and people in hollywood are trying to make like like comic book movies you can't comic books do something film can't comic books have like insane situations that you can it would cost you billions of dollars to actually get well like none of the avengers films have touched the comics very few like comic book movies can like you know sin city is one of the few examples where it was done really well or like 300 where it's almost page for page out of the graphic novel but even then it takes an insane amount of focus to be able to do that when somebody can draw it and somebody can write it you know yeah and the other the other thing i've noticed about like now i did like sin city but um zach snyder's way of making films is that he basically just uses the graphic novels as the storyboards yeah which which I'm not a huge fan. I'm not a huge fan of because I already have like Watchmen and 300 and it's kind of like you know what am, what am I going to get out of this movie? Well with Watchmen any different. With Watchmen With it's Watchmen like, he changed the ending. Yeah, he I mean he changed the entire point of it. He changed the yeah. you lose in Watchmen especially you lose you you lose like the sense of time and place. You lose everything when you change the ending. And then, it, but on, on the note of him using it as like storyboards, I don't. On one hand, I I don't mind it because I'm like, well, I would rather it be schlocky but be a comic book movie because I feel like if you're into comic books, you need to look at yourself in the face and go, there's something only this medium can accomplish. But on the other hand, it's like, well, why does Watchmen need to be made into a movie? How about we just get the word out about the book like why does like an anime like ghost in a shell like ghost in a shell is is one of my favorite anime why does it need to be made into a live action movie it doesn't have people show some respect for the 95 film or like you know something only animation could do the guy who did the original ghost in a shell who directed that uh Mamoru oshi um i i know people who worked on that film and they did things he, he chose to do Ghost in the Shell animated because that's the only way you could do it well. And you can tell in the live action Ghost in the Shell, they fucked it up. And it's not because of Scarlett Johansson. It's because they don't understand what they're working with. Yeah, and I think too, in comic books and in anime, the creator is allowed to get a lot weirder than you are in film. With film, there has to be some kind of believability to everything that's happening. And, uh, I mean, with comic books, man, you can be as weird and as far out there and convoluted, and people still eat it up. 
you know, I've noticed that about comic books as well. And anime. Anime especially. Anime yeah. especially. I mean, uh, there's... Uh, I was checking the, bat- the battery. Um, yeah, now anime is kind of like its own thing where there's like a ton of just like really shitty anime. But then there's anime that have literally influenced, you know, like Firefly comes from Cowboy Bebop. Or, you know, you have... the Like, you could be just a fan of Gundam. There's a bunch of people mm-hmm. who like don't watch anime, but in general, but we'll watch Dragon Ball Z or some shit like that. Yeah. And it's really interesting that that's like its own only area. And because of that, it's like, why, why try and make live action for it? That's only something Hollywood ever tries. They always try like Mm -hmm. Death Note or, you know, the Dragon Ball Z movie or Ghost of Shadows. Like, why do you have to try and do that? Because you can never, ever capture the energy of that. And then you have Wes Anderson going more and more animation. Yeah. Yeah, you know, with Isle of Dogs, <laughs> which is, I'm super excited for. I don't know if you saw the new clip that they just released for Isle of Dogs. Oh, it's a, it's basically a dog fight. <laughs> um, <laughs> a dog fight over some, like, rotten apple cores. <laughs> yeah, but, and I mean, you know, that's, that, that's a movie he, you know, he openly stated it was inspired by a lot of anime that he watches. And uh, he wanted to make a very Japanese type of film. So there's like robot dogs and, you know, like uh, the whole like totalitarian state and this trash island that all the dogs, you know, and it's yeah, great. It's, very, very it's, Japanese. Yeah. And it, it seems like the story is absolutely insane. A 12 year old boy steals an airplane to go to the trash island to find his dog. And it leads him into this war with like mecha dogs, and you know what I mean. And it's like, yeah, it's and it actually just got rated. It's a PG thirteen movie, so there's going to be some some violence. It's not well, and that's that just goes to show though that people don't they they go in the West they go oh it's animated it's it's a kids film they go yeah. I had to explain to a, a film professor that I was like all of the best like anime. Or what's considered the best, like Cowboy Bebop, Outlaw Star, Big O, stuff like that, even Gundam Wing. Um, those are all all the directors on that go. I'm influ- I was influenced by Western film. Mm-hmm. Now you have Wes Anderson going. I want to make a Japanese style, you know, animation, and it's because Western animation lags so far behind because they they're not willing to explore those themes like. You know, Neon uh, Genesis Evangelion is one of those crazy ass anime with they have films exploring just different endings, and it's mm-hmm. super you know symbolic in all this. Um, basically, the mechs are are your actual mother, and you're piloting your mother. You're going in her womb and everything. So like, yeah, just really <laughs> like crazy Japanese shit. But you know, that's what that's how they view animation there. Whereas over here, it's just like. Um, Spider-Man and his spectacular friends, uh, House of Mouse. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know what was that? Uh, um, what was that one animation uh, that was on Adult Swim, and it looked like Xbox original Xbox graphics. Oh, was, that's a that's a I think that's Xander. Oh, Angel. Yeah, uh, uh, Xander uh, Renegade Angel. Renegade Angel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, but that's that's, the, that's an example of using, like, of Western animation done, like, well. Because, like, a lot of the, uh, like, Aqua Teen Hunger Force or uh, 12 Ounce Mouse or, uh, you know, just any of those where they understand how to use... Those people understood how to use animation and use it yeah. well. And you, and you do some voice acting as well, right? I do. I do. Yeah. So what's your take on the whole voice acting industry versus... Uh, real, not not real acting, but you know, live action acting. Um, part of me, I, I understand where people come from. They go, voice acting isn't real acting, because a good voice actor, they make it seem like effortless. But to get to that point where you can read a line, and you know, like I just got done voicing uh, for a PlayStation game, and I do a, a couple of characters on there. And, I mean, like, countless takes. Just, just so, you know, just so that, you know, they have options to play with. And a lot of that is for things that people click past. Or, 
uh, but just in general, I, I think that there's a lot, there's a stigma that needs to be broken about it. Um, people don't, on one hand, people want to do voice acting and voice over way too much and they put it up on this pedestal. But on the other hand, I, I remember going to an agent in um, Alabama uh, who literally told me in front of a director that, you know, voice acting isn't real acting. And, you know, my feelings don't really get hurt, but at the same time, it's not pleasant to hear that because when they do try to offer voice acting or voiceover lessons, you know they're not coming from a place where they understand it. People who pursue, who generally pursue voice acting, voiceover, typically want to do voiceover, which is dubbing for anime or, you know, they want to do cartoons and video games. And a lot of it is audiobooks, commercials, and other stuff that requires... Uh, knowledge on how to, you know, work this muscle. And it's a very nuanced thing. Yeah, would you say it's more competitive than live action? Oh, extremely, or? extremely more competitive. You can go, like right now, I could pull up my email and be like, do you want to do NCIS? You, you can do extra work for the, the rest of your life. There is no extra work with, with voice acting. You either are doing this or you're not, period. There is no like extra stuff and even being able to do it's funny we were talking about indie film before there's a lot of indie stuff with voice acting and voiceover and especially with video games but the pay is lower you know for cartoons and anything like that the pay is a lot lower it's commercials and audiobooks you get a little bit more pay but on the flip side it's extremely competitive because people will go to conventions and you'll be like, oh my god, you were in this video game? Holy fuck, let me get a picture with you or let me get your autograph. Like, just shit like that where there's, I don't know, I don't want to say there's guilt involved, but you're like, oh, I only did like a few lines. But for those people, and we were talking about how they're spending most time in video games, they're hearing those lines like constantly or that may be their, their favorite character. That may be like, it's something weird happened in the game, something really funny that is completely out of context of what you're recording it for. And in film, you can't really achieve that because what you're seeing on the screen is what you get. Whereas hearing like a sprite or a model say something can be completely different because they can't replicate human beings perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, often as well with projects that require voiceover one actor might voice several characters. Right, thus, right. You know, you can have just maybe just a small group of small group of actors voicing everyone. And I mean... So, yeah. I mean, like, look at... As much as I hate to bring up this show, because I really dislike it, uh, Rick and Morty. <laughs> <laughs> but you can really tell that it's, like, one guy or two guys voicing most of the characters. Yeah, and I mean... Probably, like, a better, like, example would be, like, maybe, like, Dragon Ball Z because you have, like, uh, there's this guy named uh, Christopher Sabat or Sabat, I forget. But he does Piccolo, Yamcha, Korin. I, I think he does, like, probably six other characters. He's also directing the other voice actors. He's also doing the script supervising. You know, it's it's a very it's a very tight group to get in. And it's one of those things where every time people want to get into it because they're like oh awesome i can do like a funny voice it's just like yeah but okay it, within that funny voice there's a place where you have to be able to say like paragraphs you can't just say like one-liners can you say like a paragraph can you belch as that character can you like eat as that character it's so, it's so like involved and like that's why they have one pr guy voicing so many people and then yeah it not only can you say that funny line and do all that, but can you do 30 takes? Yeah, yeah. Can you maintain paragraph? it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not easy. <laughs> no. It's probably easier to do live action, to be honest, and especially because then you can also use your body to really emote. Yeah. Using your face. I was talking to Emmett and earlier this week about that. You know, live action, it's very much centered on your face and your eyes. And I think it's a lot easier to emote with your face and your eyes rather than with your voice because you kind of have, it's almost counterintuitive in some, in some cases to try to 
show emotion through your voice. You right. Know? It's it's almost like classical acting in a way because you're limited. You know, like if you just shut your eyes and then I, the way the way that I say something or like the way the the little inflections on certain words, it, it always reminds me of like Anthony Hopkins. Like when he's not doing Hannibal Lecter, he has like a certain like pattern in the way he speaks. Like Christopher Lee, you could shut your eyes, or Morgan Freeman, you could shut your eyes and hear their voices. It's very very practiced, and those people did theater. You can tell that they did mm-hmm. theater. Whereas in film, in especially nowadays, how many do they just grab and they're like, "You look hot, come here." You yeah. because half the people. Half the people watching the film have to process it visually, and they have to listen, and they have to pay attention to the plot. Whereas gamers and people who are watching anime are typically super, super into their hobby. So mm-hmm. if the voice acting's bad, they just assume the voice acting is going to be bad. Basically, they they don't like you go to a movie. You don't assume the acting is going to be bad. You assume that the director knows what he's doing until you're proven wrong. Whereas Walking into voice acting, they just assume it's going to be a bad dub or a bad, you know, voice acting in general until you prove them wrong. It's a it's a double yeah. standard. Especially, I mean, I think especially with games, there's so many games that have absolutely terrible voice acting. Like, uh, and even you know, fun games like uh, Just Cause Two had atrocious voice acting. I couldn't make it through the main story of that game just because of how bad the voice acting was. But there are a few games that they really stand out as far as their voice acting. The the Deus Ex games, especially, I thought, to me. You know, but they also just had good writing, I thought. That really helped. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. and that is, that really is. It comes down to the writing, and it comes down to having people who know what they're doing. Um, Les Claypool, a friend of mine, not the bassist Les Claypool, is share the <laughs> same name, but uh, he was telling me how. They did, uh, I think he he did either some of Dragon Ball Z or one of those, but he did that on uh, in his garage, basically. Or he, I know he did Resident Evil in his garage, one of the games. And, you know, just directing people, having somebody who knows what it's supposed to look like. I mean, he, he him and his wife directly worked with uh, the Mamoru Oshii on Ghost in the Shell, which was considered... It basically, it brought like anime and that that stuff over here, and that was one of the ones where it was considered to have like, a good dub, where it was lip synced well and like the meanings weren't completely lost. And at the same time, though, uh, it, it can be overrated because a lot, a lot of times you do miss out a lot with voiceover, and sometimes it's just better to have the subtitles and not take away from it but for video games and stuff where it's written with intended english voice actors like cowboy bebop something like that it it usually goes over well yeah and studio ghibli i think does a good job of dubs yeah yeah and that's interesting you mentioned that because they don't they hardly ever use voice actors or like trained voice actors they get they most of the time because that's disney most of the time they grab like Christian Bale did Howl's Moving yeah, Castle. Yeah. Or, you know, they get Christian. people like that. But ironically, Christian Bale's like first big roles in Pocahontas is like doing like uh, voiceover actually. Or uh, voice acting rather. And then and then interesting enough, he was in Terrence Malick's Pocahontas, the New World. Yeah, right. As as uh, John Smith, right? Right. You know, he was No, he wasn't John Smith, he was the other guy. Um, I know, I know. He's in, the guy that ended up marrying Pocahontas. I know that's who he played in the Disney Pocahontas. Was the guy who actually marries, the guy who actually marries yeah. Pocahontas. I'm looking it up right now. What like what the guy's name is? Yeah, because I I really like the New World. Um, John Rolf. John Roth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, Christian Bale though he was in Empire of the Sun. As a kid, I mean, he's been yeah. I mean, he's, he's been doing stuff for a long. He's time. been in the uh, he's been in the mouse trap for a little while. He was a character named Thomas in the animated Pocahontas movie. One of the main characters. Yeah, that was supposed to be like John Roth, basically. Like they okay. look pretty identical. I yeah, I totally like. I haven't seen that movie in years, so yeah. Um, <laughs> it's it's not one of their um. Oh, I've, oh, Mel Gibson is John Smith. 
maybe I'll rewatch it. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> crazy, crazy Uncle Mel coming to the new world. <laughs> That's fucking crazy that Mel Gibson is in Pocahontas. That's crazy. What I know. The hell? As, as the main, as not the titular character, but like the main John Smith. I mean the. That's Mel Gibson. Wow, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I would love. I would, you know, um, I would. I would love to work with Mel Gibson sometimes. You know, somewhere down the line. I feel like. I mean, I know that he's like really bipolar, and you can see it when he does when he's on his interviews and his eyes are just like really wide. He's just talking like. <laughs> I mean, like he's just manic, but I think it would be really fun just from a directing point. To direct someone who's <laughs> manic, or you know what I mean, someone who's maybe a little bit more unhinged, especially in something like an action movie. Yeah, for sure. I, like Get yeah. That Gringo is a really good example of that. Yeah, I think that you know, I, I, there's something to a lot of a lot of action movies, especially nowadays, where you don't really feel like the action stars are. You don't really feel like they have a purpose in the film. I can only watch The Rock so many times before it gets kind of boring. Like I know he's like he always plays the same character. He's like the generally pretty good guy. Um who's this but he's going around killing enemies and doing this kind of stuff. And it's like, man, I like the the action stars, you know that you got kind of in the 80s and you know where they were not perfect, you know, like Bruce Willis before he uh, just started making Die Hard 20. Yeah. <laughs> you know? He wasn't that great of a guy in the first Die Hard, which is why I thought it made it better than the others. But he was more realistic, you know? I think there's something with action. I, I thought Brawl and Cell Block 99 did it pretty well. You know, where Vince Vaughn is pretty I, I think there has, there has to be a point to the violence. Yeah, there, ha- there has. Yeah, to be- that's what I'm getting to. Yeah. yeah, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of movies where it just feels like this kind of character. I mean, I, I don't really believe this character as a as an action star, as a person who's going to go around killing a lot of people. You know? Yeah, or like there's no like they're completely like recovered, or you know, there's no uh, like damage to them or anything like that. Yeah, they 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 uh, somehow. They somehow make it to the end of the film looking just as good as they did in the beginning. Yeah. And you know, I think I think that's my one of my main problems with a lot of the comic book movies is there's you know, watching a Marvel movie for me is like watching an episode of Family Guy. Like you know it's all gonna be right back to everything being fine at the end. Yeah. You know, like not much is gonna has you know, is gonna change. This character, yeah, is going to become this superhero. But then at the end, it's going to be like they almost like in the next movie, they almost act like it didn't happen. But I mean, we're getting how many of these Marvel movies this year alone, and it's pretty much all the same basic story with these characters that you know are going to be in later iterations. Like you know, the Doctor Strange is going to be the next Infinity. You yeah, know, it's like nothing, nothing bad. Yeah, it's like Spider Man One, like. Nothing bad can happen to Spider-Man in this movie because they have to make another Spider-Man. Yeah. Yeah, like exactly. he can't he can't die. That's for damn sure. And like, oh, MJ dies. Well, he'll probably get over it and go. Or like Gwen Stacy dies. Ah, eh, he's got MJ. Or like, you know, something like that. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know, when you know that these actors, you know, and they announce that these actors are returning on future Marvel films. Yeah. Then when you watch the movie, there's just no tension. You know that, you know that they're gonna get out alive. I mean, that's the problem I have with Superman movies generally is because, I mean, Superman really can't die unless the other character has kryptonite. But then you know that they're not gonna kill off Superman. Like, spoiler alert: Batman versus Superman. You know, he supposedly dies at the end, but then yeah, they leave it off like, oh, he's not dead. Yeah, and I knew that they weren't gonna kill him off because he's too much of a cash cow, a potential cash cow. And then, of course, in the Justice League, they bring him back, CG, CGI'd out his oh, mustache. Oh, my God. Well, like, oh. another, big, another big problem with that is that they try to do, like, the Dark Knight Returns basically ends that way, where 
Batman like hits him a bunch and then a nuke goes off and Superman's like Superman basically like gets his ass beat with a giant kryptonite fist. They should have just used all that shit. And Superman yeah. has to work for Lex Luthor as president. In any way he's shamed, he's broken, then he supposedly dies. But they they can never go like all the way in a comic book movie. When they go to adapt something, it's like they stop just at the point where it's a good story because right, well, for the next one. And eh, for the next one. And it's just like what what's the point? What where where yeah. it's like a Batman movie. It's like I a lot of people don't like Batman Forever, but it's one of my favorites because the whole point of the movie is like, well, Batman's like, well, what's really like the point? I just keep going out there and doing this and doing this. He's like, at some point it has to end. I either I die or, you know, something happens and he he moves on from it. And and he just decides, "All right, well, I'll just keep being Batman because I want to. And yeah. it has a, a definite beginning and a definite end. And that's it. It doesn't go, well, we need to get the rest of the Justice League. You know? Yeah, and that's what I liked about the Christopher Nolan Batman movies as well. Because they weren't really focused on selling you a sequel with each film. In fact, you know, in the Dark Knight uh Rises. I, I wanted to say Returns, but in The Dark Knight Rises, as much as I had a lot of problems with the movie, I did like the fact that they really end Batman's story, and it's like this is we're cutting it off. It's a trilogy in a very like, interesting off. way too, because he he gets away. Usually, Batman when he has an ending like that, it's like like the the canon like ending. I guess is he's alone as an old man and then he gets this you know he gets uh sorry yeah, I'm sure that. uh he gets this a boy terry mcginnis to, in the future to come and be the new batman basically and he like coaches yeah, him through a computer Beyond. yeah so uh it was very interesting that they gave him just such a happy ending just such a it, it's very interesting too because it almost makes you think well is he really like alive well, at the end yeah I think that yeah, how happy it was, and it almost seemed like it was it was kind of a dreamy way that they shot that scene to. It makes you think that maybe that Alfred is fabricating this story, that the real story is something else. But I do have to say that I do love the Dark Knight Rises for um <laughs> for all the memes that have come out of it. No, that's you're a big, an example of like, the big beginning. Man. You're a big man. Kabbalah oh, gives you power for me. <laughs> I was born in the shadow. I didn't see the light until there was already a man. And the fire rises. Yeah. It's just like, 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 <laughs> if I take that mask off, are you gonna die? <laughs> be quite painful. For you. Like, like the, <laughs> the beginning part of Dark Knight Rises, they could have just released that. They could have just released <laughs> yeah. that, and it would have been, it, like, they should have. They should have released that before the movie came out, and that, but that would have been better than the actual fucking movie. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like that was, no, that's just, insane. I would just want to see a standalone Bane movie. Uh, you know, because, yeah. I thought I thought Tom Hardy was great as Bane. That was probably the best part of the movie. I mean, it was the most memeable part of the movie too. Bane posting is still going pretty strong. Yeah, it's um, been six years. Yeah, yeah, and people are still, you know, you go on a eight chan and stuff, and you still see Bane. Quite yeah, a lot. no, no Marvel <laughs> movie has gotten that. No Marvel movie has no. Bane posting. No, they don't. I mean, because all the Marvel villains are pretty bland. I mean, they just don't, they just don't, like, there's good stories you can tell, I think, like, I'm a Punisher and Daredevil fan from the comics, but it's an example of, it doesn't, you're never, they're never gonna go far enough with them to matter, like, Daredevil is constantly having people, like, die on his ass, or just failing, he just fails all the fucking time, and Mm -hmm. it's, like, Spider-Man, he constantly fails, like, they never, they did it in Amazing Spider-Man too, where like he shoots his web, and he like snaps your fucking neck, and yeah. they actually show that. 
and I was like, oh, wow, but it's lost on the audience because they've shown Spider-Man way too fucking much. He has too many, like, gizmos. Like, he shouldn't have... Just give him his, like, cloth costume and that's it. He should just get the shit beaten yeah. out of him. Like, the Tobey Maguire and, uh, and Willem scene in um, Spider-Man 1, where he's just getting the shit beat out of him. You're like, damn, Spider-Man's getting his ass beat. Like, you know, I mean, he really got his fucking ass beat right there. But, and that looked super cool. He's like... And then, like, his foot fucking comes down, like... Ah! <laughs> and that had that was probably like the first example of ba- a bane posting thing. He's like, "You and I could rule this city, Spider Man." <laughs> <laughs> well, Think about it. <laughs> well, and the Green Goblin. I mean, he got killed by his own like gear messing up. He's like, like yeah, because he's like, <laughs> Peter. Oh, <laughs> remember me, Norman Osborn? He's like, <laughs> does that fucking flip? <laughs> He gets fucking stabbed, like yeah. And then they play the Nickelback song at the end, <laughs> like like that. Like that's how a comic book movie should be, though. That's how they yeah, should yeah. be. Spider Man one and two were kind of my peak comic book films. Yeah, Sp- you know, I think that they were just great because they didn't take themselves seriously. They yeah. were really fun um, and campy. But, I mean, they still had good stories and, like, likable, interesting characters within that framework of being just kind of stupid movies. Yeah, it's, um, I really like Batman Begins. Like, I definitely think that's the best, like, overall, like, best Nolan Batman film. But at the same time, it's like, I like Batman as, like, a detective, I guess. And, like, Mm -hmm. you get, they get away from the core of the essence. Like, in the new, like, now with, like, Ben Affleck as Batman, he has, like, bat armor. And he has, like, he just, like, walks around. Like, he's not even trying to be Bruce Wayne. He just, like, walks in the computer room. And this is how they're going to show him being smart. He's like, uh, I'm going to move this (laughs) USB right here. Okay. Uh, I'm hacking it. (laughs) I moved the USB (laughs) over. Like, in the comics, they do shit where... I invented a satellite that can that has the information to kill every Justice League member. And like he's like he's like insane. He's like I have a weapon that just in case Clark goes crazy, he's my best friend, but I will kill his ass. I do have kryptonite well, bullets. I think I think the Dark Knight also did that pretty well because he like basically has the NSA surveillance style yeah, on yeah, everybody and, in Gotham City and he's just spying on everyone and making and Fox gets like totally freaked out by him. <laughs> yeah, and leaves. At He's the like, end. yeah, and he blows you know? it up to make him feel better to keep a friend, basically. But that's yeah, you know, that's how he is, and like that's why I always thought with the Dark Knight uh, Rises that it's kind of like where well the Arkham games kind of do this. I'll backtrack a bit. So they basically the Arkham games in where. He basically goes and he everybody finds out who he is. Like Scarecrow takes his mask off, but then he just beats the fuck out of Scarecrow on camera, and like mm-hmm. basically kills him. And uh, he because he feels guilty over Jason Todd and everything, and everybody's like, "Oh my God, Bruce Wayne's!" And he's just walking to his mansion, and then the mansion blows up, and Alfred yeah. had, and his pacemaker is tied to the mansion, and he fucking dies. Like Batman's like this mm-hmm. and saying that like he had a contingency play. He sinks the caves into the ground, like it's gone. But because of that, because he doesn't have like the obligation to be Bruce Wayne, he just he just decides he's like, Well, like, my life is any like slight chance I had at, at that life is over. So he just goes mm-hmm. full on into it. And he has like horses and shit. They like he trains like bat people to ride in. This is from the Dark Knight Returns, but they basically ride in. Oh yeah. Yeah, and they like wipe they just like wipe out all the crime and, and he becomes like worse than Batman. He becomes like a completely new like character essentially. He in the games rather, he basically he uses the fear gas and gases fucking criminals and like he's like this demon basically that they're like they piss their pants over and the, the streets are clean now. It's because he was holding on the, it just cost him his humanity and it's something that they can't basically show in films because yeah, yeah, like they're not gonna they're not gonna um, make the the comic Arkham Asylum into a movie because it's too 
freaking weird. Oh, yeah, no. And But yeah. imagine that animated, though. That's yeah, the thing. Like, like, that would be pretty insane. Yeah. You'd have to have, like... You know, you'd... I, I'd almost see that as, like, a... Uh, um, like, like, animated to... Uh, like dark side of the moon or something yeah something, well you know? i mean that's one of the better like batman like batman all the good batman stories are in graphic novels like they're mm-hmm. always they never cite the actual comics they always just cite the graphic novels they're like dark knight returns or year one or killing joke or any of those but arkham yeah. asylum is definitely like batman is like a psychological character is or yeah. and and not to try to get too deep into the batman conversation but it's just something that those films can never fully get into. Yeah, and you know what Batman villain I'm surprised they haven't made a movie about because I think it could be very interesting. Now, I would I wouldn't trust whoever's making Batman movies right now to do it properly. I would say, you know, as far as any of the other directors, Christopher Nolan, I'd want him to direct it would be using the villain of Hush just because I love the fact that Hush makes himself is ser- you know it's like a serial killer taking skin grafts off of people to make himself look exactly like Bruce Wayne in an attempt to base to um, become like the evil Bruce Wayne. So then there's two Bruce Waynes in Gotham, and one is good and one is evil. And you know, of course, they go back. You know, he's a childhood friend of Bruce Wayne's. And uh, and didn't and he had a really messed up childhood and yeah he murdered he, he murdered his own parents to get to the money yeah he murdered his yeah he murdered his own parents and then later on in life he comes and he starts killing people so he can become the doppelganger to Bruce Wayne which I think would be a very would make for a very interesting Batman not not one but it would have to it would almost be like a Silence of the Lamb style. Yeah, so. Reffin Reffin originally wanted to direct a Batman movie, but he, they wouldn't let they he basically wanted to do like quasi Arkham Asylum and they wouldn't mm-hmm. obviously they they were like no, we're not going to let Reffin do this. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, instead he did the Neon Demon. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I mean like uh I mean there's there's plenty of now I'm definitely a person who's very outspoken about superhero fatigue in films, but it's not so much the superheroes. It's just the fact that they just, they just want to do the same story over again. And it's, it's like star Wars now, or they just want to sell either ideologies or they want to sell toys. They're not going to kill off characters because yeah, or maybe have, or make a movie that's now they made Logan and Deadpool, but, I don't know if DC is going to go down that route of saying, "Yeah, let's make an R-rated film about Batman where we focus they, on." They won't. Uh, where you know where Bruce Wayne is basically doing like uh, the Tom Hardy thing, where Christopher Nolan or no, not Christopher Nolan, Christian Bale basically plays this two. You know what I mean? Two characters in one, and one one character is an evil serial killer. Like, I mean, like if you know if it was Christian Bale reprising his role as Batman, it'd almost be like. Bruce Wayne and then Patrick Bateman in one movie. Yeah, I mean, that's honestly how. I mean, that's I mean, that's basically who Bruce Wayne is, and I mean, they should have just gone that route because he didn't make a ve- he didn't make a very good like Bruce Wayne in my opinion. He kind of did yeah. in Batman Begins, but I think Val Kilmer had that perfect split of just like dickhead mm-hmm. Bruce Wayne and trying to find like that psychological balance between them anyways yeah well uh i think we'll kind of cut it off now because we're going pretty long yeah yeah we've gone we've gone for almost like two hours uh yeah i think by the time i edit this down it'll be about an hour 20 minutes so yeah so do you have anything you want to shout out other than spriggan watch our motherfucking movie uh no uh sculptures a uh short horror film I worked on it will be released momentarily I have um, a project that is completely bullshit about textures in my house at the walls and like other shit um, in this aquarium that I have it's gonna be about an hour long um, 
set to Andy Stott's Luxury Problems. Uh, that will be it's like a Warhol film. Yeah, it's yeah, basically, <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, avant-garde. But uh, that'll be released um, sometime this week. But yeah, no, just okay, cool. keep an eye out for Spriggan. Deuces. Oh, like Red Claw Concert. Thanks, Dylan. Join us next time. I'll be talking to some other filmmakers in the area.